Well, John Podesta, thanks so much for joining the world. We might start with a matter about which you have personal, bitter personal experience, it might be said, and that's resilience to foreign interference. Now, mm -hmm. you'd be aware, I presume, that the Australian Parliament and political parties were the subject of some cyber attack before your arrival. Is there anything you understand about Australia's institutions that would satisfy you that they are safe from intrusion? Well, I think this is something that governments around the, across the globe are, have to uh, increase their uh, awareness of, security of, but it's not just the problem of governance. Uh, I think what we saw in 2016, what we saw before that uh, in, the, in the interference in the Brexit campaign, uh, the, the French election, etc., is that uh, governments, in our case, particularly the Russian government, uh, thought there was a lot of return on, on investment to directly interfere, to hack into uh, our systems, to weaponize uh, that information to, to have a political outcome. You know, uh, one thing that uh, is well worth remembering is that in 2008, both the Obama campaign and McCain campaign were hacked by the Chinese uh, security authorities. That was for an intelligence operation. I think they were trying to figure out uh, once in office what would either one of these candidates do. It was bipartisan. I think what was different about, uh, about Brexit, about 2016, and I think uh, what we have to fear uh, is the weaponization uh, of that intelligence uh, to directly interfere in democratic institutions. So just to relate that back, John Podesta, to Australia's circumstance, obviously there was a Russian connection with the US attacks, but can you understand any Chinese interest in wanting to delegitimize or compromise Australia's democratic processes, and why? Well, I, you know, the, quite, the first question is, do they have the capability? I think the answer to that is yes. I think, do they have the motive uh, I think, again, what we've seen uh, by the Chinese so far uh, has been largely uh, an intelligence operation. They're obviously, on the pro private sector side, they've also stolen intellectual property, used that, to, I think, to build their industry. All right. Well, just to continue with the Chinese presumption for the moment, do you have any reason to suspect that their motives might be retaliatory? For that, I mean, uh, some sort well, of action against, say, the Huawei decision. Yeah. Of course, the Australians were were out with a firm position that, that uh, th they did not want to see their 5G networks compromised. And, uh, excluded Huawei from uh, participation in the in the build out here, uh, and I think that uh, the uh, Chinese are known to retaliate for that. Whether that takes the form of retaliation through political activity or, uh, you know, uh, sometimes in the case of com more commercial activity. Uh, it remains to be seen. Let's go to the US election, though. What's your, your biggest lesson learnt, would you say, from your experience in 2016? In other words, what will it take for Donald Trump to be beaten? I think that what uh, the Democratic candidates need to do uh, is two things. One is to continue to make the case that he's temperamentally unfit and unqualified to be president, that he's made bad judgments, that he uh, ran as a populist, but he governs as a plutocrat. Uh, Do you think that sort of takes care of itself, the prosecution of that argument? Well, I think it's kind of easy in his case because he proves it every day. Uh, and uh, then you have to uh, provide a positive alternative, that you can get the economy uh, uh, going for the middle and for the bottom, that you can get wages for the middle growing again, uh, that you have a tax policy that's going to support a more long-term sustainable uh, growth in the in the country and really uh, benefit the middle and not only those people at the very top. And I think that's what the Democratic candidates are uh, competing with. Uh, but ultimately, I think what Democratic voters are looking for is who can take this guy on, who can get him out of the Oval Office, who can get the country back on uh, the path of uh, inclusive values. And we just uh, we have some exciting candidates who I think are going to be able to do that. Yeah, well, that's the strategy. Let me ask you then about some of the candidates, just to name a few. Kirsten Gillibrand, Kamala Harris, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, and more recently, Beto O'Rourke. Is there anyone among them that you think uh, can best uh, 
prosecute those arguments or, you know, be an adequate foil against the, it must be said, somewhat formidable skills of Donald Trump? Yeah, I, I think that uh, I well recognize that uh, one of the things that Trump does best is always bring the conversation back to him, usually through outrage, but he always brings it back to him. And, and it, it, that can be a trap. So uh, I think we're going to know that be through the course of the primaries. Uh, we have 10 months before the first uh, caucus goers go to the uh, cast their ballots in, in Iowa. We have debates coming up in June. Uh, so these candidates, I think, will get tested. They'll, there'll be a feel for who can really excite uh, people to get out and organize and who's got the best answers. I would say right now, there's sort of three tiers of candidates. You have at the top uh, Joe Biden, who's likely to run, and Bernie Sanders. They both suffer from the fact that uh, Biden's 76 and Bernie's 78. Uh, so but, but you really do think Biden is likely to de declare his hand? I think he's likely to run, uh, although I think, you know, he's still, uh, uh, he, until, until you're in, you're not in. Yeah. So, but I think he's given every indication, his team has certainly given every indication that he's going to run. Uh, there's another group that have sort of busted out of the pack, as it were, uh, uh, Kamala Harris, uh, uh, Beto, they've got, added a lot of excitement to the race. Uh, I'd put Elizabeth Warren, Cory Booker probably in that tier. And then there are a lot of people who are accomplished, uh, have uh, been e either uh, people like uh, Kirsten Gillibrand, Governor Hickenlooper, uh, Governors uh, Julian Castro, the former successful mayor of San Antonio. Uh, but they, um, they're they all kind of s sitting around 1% in the in the national polls and in the state polls. All right, and just finally, John, obviously hovering over all of this is one outstanding body of work, which is the Robert Mueller uh, investigation. If and when that eventually lands in or around the primary process, what's your advice to either Democrats in Congress or those involved in the primaries about uh, acting on that timidly or otherwise once it comes out? I guess my first piece of advice is to read it before you react. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think Mueller's done an incredible job, professional job. He's kept the whole thing buttoned up. He's got 37 indictments. I think there are people pending trial like Roger Stone. There's uh, the Manafort was just uh, the uh, was dirt on Hillary. So we know there was collusion. The question is, is there a criminal conspiracy? Mm -hmm. And I think it's it's worth waiting for Mueller to finally report and render his judgment and say what he thinks about the facts. Uh, and then, the, the, you know, the rest will, I think, fall into place. John Podesta, that is all that we have time for today. Thanks again for joining us on The World. Glad, glad to be here. <laughs>